Uh, but typically, so what I've set it up to do is it, it, it's going to ping you on Twitter. Uh, and typically that actually makes it easier to promote anyone who wants to come in and ask questions. Nice. Um, and I'm also going to set up a banner. I'm also going to set up a banner, the tech resume. Uh, actually, it's just the tech resume dot com, right? Um, you have the dot com there. Uh, So I'm just I'm just gonna with Ger Gerge. Oh, nice. Uh, so that then I can then I can do yours. things like uh, add the I can add the little uh, banner. Nice. All right. Uh, then the other thing I I realized that we also have the writing group the the one from uh, Will Larson. So I yep. can also cross promote there. Uh, in case anyone wants to check it out. Yeah, we, we can mention if, if people are, because I, I think yeah, if we have anyone in the audience who's interested in, in writing or, or writing more, that's a great place to come to. Where do you think, do you think I should write it? Uh, I should post it in this channel? Uh, actually, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I think we mentioned it. I, I, I think let's just mention it on Twitter. Like, I, yeah, I, yeah, I think yeah. that group is, is growing organically. Like, it's... Chatting about the book here. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna RT on Twitter and then and then I think we can get started. Uh, I got a I got a few questions async because not yes. everyone can attend. Um, but I've also prepped quite a few quite a few things because uh, I got a I got an advanced copy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, shall we start? Yeah, let's let's kick off. Uh, cool. It's it's a uh, it's really cool to meet you. Uh, you know, finally, after, after, you know, talking on Twitter for like probably over a year. I actually, I don't know how long we've, we've known each other. Yeah, it, it has been roughly a year. <laughs> um, I found you first when I was basically, I think, like preparing notes on like writing advice. And then I found your blog post and then your blog post linked me to Urs from Google. Uh, and it was, it, and that's how that's how this whole that's partially how my book got started. So I think I think that did pretty well. Um, so uh, I was just I was just kind of curious, like, what's your uh, maybe you know maybe for those who are new to you, uh, what's your general story, uh, and why are you interested in resumes? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one because resumes are a little bit of not not your your typical thing and i'm actually less interested in it but i i managed to write a book about it but in general i've been doing software engineering for a long time starting from small companies uh, and then at some point maybe eight years ago or so uh, as i moved up to london i worked at jp morgan then i moved to skype and, and from there on i guess uh as, as a mix of just chance, luck, and and also maybe combining where I wanted to go, I managed to work at high growth companies. So it was Skype, a uh, bit later than Skyscanner. Then four years ago, I joined Uber. And in, in all, all, all cases, it was a pretty similar pattern of, I just was lucky enough to join a place that was growing really quickly. We were building something that was really interesting. Typically, a lot of people used it. Uh, and so, so this is what, what I was doing at, at Uber. I was, uh, I, I became an engineering manager midway or pretty much like six months in or so. So I ended up leading a team and, and helping people. And on the side, I've, I've, I've been blogging for about 10 years or so. And when I, when I started blogging, the, the, the blog, the blog that you wanted to read was, um, Coding horror. So it was from, from Jeff Atwood. Jeff that, Atwood. that was the, that was the ultimate blog at, at least. From, from what I remember. And there were lots of different blogs by them. So blogging was really popular. I had a personal blog and I have been writing it on and off for years. So starting from uh, writing my learnings about .NET 10 years ago and, and the different things that I did. And about, I think four years ago, so around the time when I started at Uber, maybe a little bit later, I just decided to start anew. And I started this blog called The Pragmatic Engineer. And I just wanted to capture some of the learnings that I've seen on, on software engineering in, in general. Uh, and I was actually, when I started, the, my blog was influenced. My first few articles were written in a similar style to what Jeff Atwood did. So take a statement, take a couple of blog articles, uh, uh, quote them, put your two cents. And I, I think I wrote like seven articles in two months. I started to do this and, and then I forgot about it. And ironically, I came back to it when, when, when it was picked up on Hacker News. One of the articles 
I think about, I, I did a piece on how I think you should never comment your code with some, some really strong take. It was picked up by Hacker News and a lot of people started to check out and, and that's when I actually learned about Hacker News. And this, this must've been like four or five years ago, something along that. And and I and then I started to go back to sometimes writing on, on the blog and uh, I, I didn't really have a, a clear strategy here, but I, I am, so over time, I felt more and more, the more I talk with people inside Uber and the people outside Uber, that there's a little bit of a divide of a, this kind of bubble, uh, which is between the, these fast growing tech companies that you know about, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Ubers, the Lyfts, the, et cetera. I know a lot of people from this world and there's a the people who, who are what I used to be. When I started out, I, I worked at an agency in Hungary. I'm originally from Hungary and you just kind of get things done. You, you're given a Jira ticket. Uh, you don't, you know, you, you don't really know why you're doing stuff. You have the seniors and, and they're like hierarchically higher than you. They make more money. You know that there's only two types of software engineers. There's a junior developer and the senior developer. And then there's a manager who obviously makes a lot more money and they're the rules of, of life, life or death. And I really see this divide. And for example, I live in Amsterdam and there's these two types of companies. There's traditional Dutch or European companies. And of course, there's a fast moving startups, modern companies. So we're, I, I started to write a, a book about, and I, I, I've been meeting people outside of Uber, just having lunches, which is a really great way to actually just meet, just make connections. And, and I, I love in-person chats, again, both in wherever I'm traveling with COVID, I'm not traveling too much. But it is great to connect with people and just talk about, listen to to what they're doing and how they're building. Because what what I realize is, I think there's always an altism with software engineers. Everyone thinks they're doing things the best, but people rarely talk with each other. So I met, for example, this senior engineer who who had really strong feelings about how like software should be built, but they never thought to look at how, let's say, Google or Facebook does things, and they were amazed of the concept of the on call. They thought you should never be on call. Uh, and, and again, the other way around, I, I, I feel that people who are working at the likes of Facebook or Google, I, I know people who spent, for example, all their life at Uber, three or four years, and they're amazing software engineers, but they have no clue how things are built when you don't have all the infrastructure around you, uh, as, as these big companies do. So uh, anyway, lo long story short, I, 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 I really enjoy these conversations, and, and I also figure that I, I can't really talk with everyone. So I decided to write a book about what I think after all this all this many years, probably half of outside of the big tech bubble and, and half of it inside, what good software engineering to me means. And I started writing this book uh, about a year ago, actually. I I, I pitched it to publishers, uh, or really wanted to publish it, but they went with something else because there's some competition internally. The practice passed on it and I, I had a contract with Manning, so I started writing it. In the end, I, I broke up with Manning for for, for different reasons. I, I didn't, didn't think it was a great fit in terms of style. Um, and I, I was writing this book and then COVID happened. And two things happened with COVID. I stopped writing this book just because for the first few months it was pretty chaotic, I think, for everyone. And the second was a layoff started happening. And I'm in one of the companies that have been hit by the layoff. In fact, two of my, uh, both Uber and my previous company, Skyscanner, were pretty heavily Im impacted by layoffs. So people were let go. Um, and I, as I saw this, I was thinking, I was in my team, unfortunately, there were some layoffs. Uh, I was not impacted. But I was thinking, how can I help with these people? And in, in, this, in this book, originally, I had a small chapter about changing uh, careers because I or sorry, changing jobs because I think it's pretty important. As a any great software engineer I know, you you kind of want to go out on the job market and see what you're worth, figure out if you want to change or if you don't want to change. So I had this idea. Okay, well, maybe because of COVID, it might be a good idea to write a small book about just changing jobs or getting a new job because it's relevant. Uh, in the end, I, I ended up. As, as a first step, I just offered to do some resume reviews on Twitter, and I got like 300 resumes. And a lot of, <laughs> I, I I didn't realize there's so many people actually looking. This was some were laid off, some were just uh, looking for for new opportunities. I guess uh, being close to to being impacted. And then I also started to people at, at Uber and at Skyscanner reach out to me for some feedback on their resumes. And what I realized is. People's software developers' resumes are just really bad in general because they don't—they never have to be good. I've been a hiring manager for probably five years, the past five years, hiring engineers either on my team or other teams, and we didn't really care about the resumes because there were barely enough people. Like outside of new grads, who okay, you want to present yourself, but if, if you had a few years of experience, it didn't really matter how you know quote bad your resume was because we wanted to talk to you. But now with Corona, a lot of people were on the market. 
a lot of people were, were cold applying and a lot of people were telling me that they're just not getting interviews. And I, I looked at their resume and I looked be behind it and it was a solid engineer. So they were like senior engineers, but sometimes they were just not following some of the unwritten rules. Like they put photos on there or you could just see that this is not a, a local candidate. And after giving some feedback to, to these people, uh, some of them actually reported that they, they, they got through, they got offers, uh, which is great. Again, these were pretty solid engineers with multiple years of experience. And as I went through all this feedback, I, you know, 300 people, I, I did what, what usually you scale yourself. So for first 50 or so, I gave really easy feedback and I started keeping notes. Then I started noticing patterns. So I started a document where I just copy pasted stuff. And in the end, I was like, all right, why am I doing this? I'm just gonna, I created a, a PDF, it was a Google Doc initially. I sent the PDF, which is about 20 pages. And I said, just look at the, these and these and these points. And if you have any more questions, just let me know. So, <laughs> and then I had the idea, okay, how about I just, instead of just writing, so I went from, let's, let me write this big book. Okay, well, there's Corona, let me write a small chapter on getting a new job and acing the interview. And then I was like, all right, let, let me just write a small like, guide. I didn't even call it a book initially on, on resumes. So I had 20 pages or 30 pages in the PDF. I thought it would, the whole thing would be 80 pages. But when I, when I mentioned to my wife that I'm writing a book on resumes or I'm doing resume research, she was like, oh my God, that's so cheap. Like, why would you do that? Because in the resume industry, it, it is really cheap. When you look at the people who are giving resume feedback, it's career coaches who are, they're not bad people, but they're typically not people who have been, have been hiring managers or, or, or even uh, really experienced recruiters. They're either self-made people or, or or people who kind of you know didn't make it that great in, in recruiting usually. And and there's a bunch of sites as well that offer this, but it does feel really cheap and it doesn't seem professional. And I also felt a little bit like a fraud when I put this together in the sense that I have seen a lot of resumes, but who am I to say what is a great resume? So I I saw there's not many good resources. I, I wasn't as certain myself. So I did what makes sense. I reached out to the best recruiters and hiring managers I know in the industry both at uber at amazon facebook google you name it i i asked all of them hey i'm putting this together for people can you help out because i i really think i just want to double check some of these assumptions and i want to get your advice so in the end this uh, project snowballed into what is actually a book about more than fifty thousand words and more more than 200 pages I, I just did the stuff that i would really want to see there so first just input from real hiring managers and, and it's probably like more around 15 people or so uh, and the other one that I really missed from any kind of resume advice I had, I never saw actual resumes of before or after or explaining these things. So I just also put some of those things there and uh, I was able to, uh, yeah, and then this is the old, old landing page. Uh, we'll, we'll, <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll, oh, it's not the new one. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll also have a new one, but, but yeah, this is it, it, the, the new one will um, go live, but yeah. And that's the, so I, I put this together. And then the third thing that I have with this book, which I'll, I'll do with the launches, I also didn't, I, I didn't do this really to make money specifically. What I'd like to optimize is have no, the most number of people read it, like actual read it. But I know from myself as well, I, I don't appreciate free. And on my blog, everything is free. And a lot of people read it, a lot of people stop midway. I wanted to make this a paid thing and I wanted to make it a book for two reasons. First, first to have a bit of a dry run before my big book that I'm, I'm that I, I've been going towards. Second, if, if, if someone you know, thinks that it's valuable enough to pay for something, they hopefully will read it. And then the, the last thing that I wanted to make sure is, is if, if people really need it and they don't have the money, they can also uh, get it. So I'll, I'll be, I've been working, there's going to be a new launch page because I'm making it free for people who have lost their job currently and who are software engineers. So this book is very specifically is for software engineers and engineering managers. That's the place where I can give advice. Uh, I've had product managers and, 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 and um, technical writers, a few other people tell me that it was useful for them. But yeah, uh, that's where the book is. And turns out you can write a book about anything if you want to. And I'm, I'm really cautious. I, I really don't want to become this resume expert. It's just no yes. one actually put anything decent together. The internet is, is full of, of half truths. And you realize when I started to write this book, the internet, if you just Google uh, on the web page, just Google software developer resume resume on, on the internet, for example. Yeah, software developer resume. So, <laughs> so there, when you go uh, to, to the results, sorry, not necessarily the resumes, but it's just more the Google results. If you go through the first ones, first one, kick resume, resume building site. Next one, resume building site. 
third one, monster.com. Fourth one, resume game inside. The point is, what I realized, uh, I actually got through <laughs> in, in my quest to to write this. I I wrote through all these resume building sites, and they're all garbage. Those resumes are not built by software developers or hiring managers or technical recruiters, and I didn't I didn't understand why. Uh, so all of these sites turns out the resume industry there's a lot of money in it. But to make money, they it's 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 a SEO game. So they build software optimization. If you look at Resume Genius, they'll have software level resumes, and they will have two hundred other parts. There they'll have accounting, they'll have um, e economics, they'll have lawyers, yeah, food, food service, food side, <laughs> food service. Uh, so what they do is they use content writers because they're shooting at a big market. They use content writers and they just put up something. They have and they optimize for people paying. They don't optimize for your resume actually being any good. So if you look at most templates, they'll have photos and a bunch of answer patterns. And I managed to find one resume site that was actually started by a software engineer who is actually a pretty decent site. And I ended up partnering with them because they were one of the few, and they're, they don't write well on Google, <laughs> obviously. And <laughs> and talking with them, they, they've they been actually looking very much into this. It's a really intricate, um, really interesting industry where there's a couple of companies there's a lot of companies a lot of sites one or two companies hold most of them a little bit like the porn in industry as well or <laughs> <laughs> there or, or or even some like some of the food industry like like if you buy a, a mayo it's probably Unilever. it just has different names uh and yeah that's also why the advice is so shallow there's a bunch of incorrect statements my the one that and people fall for a bunch of these things. One of the, one of one of one of these ones is the ATS application tracking systems and how this claim of robots yes. scanning your resume, which I ended up talking with because I never saw I never saw this at Uber or a Skyscanner or at Microsoft. But I was like, maybe I'm just not using those ATSs. Maybe use we use something because we never did resume filtering based on keywords. Because it why would you like it's they can't even part. You don't buy an ATS for resume filtering. You buy an ATS to integrate as a recruiter with your calendar, with your scheduling, to, to make sure that you're not double booking uh, people that, that on LinkedIn you're syncing with them, et cetera. Uh, and there's these claims, uh, and, and there's a site called JobScan, which, which has you pay money to optimize for the likes of, they make it seem like they optimize for Amazon and Facebook and all these places, and it's, it's not true. They don't give you terrible advice, but they charge you money for something that's not there. So there's a bunch of stuff invented. So I, I ended up going really deep in this. Uh, it's not, not the goal, but it, it just shows that I think it's really interesting. Any industry you touch, turns out there's an industry, there's a lot of money in this. Uh, I, I I don't know if I should hope or not that these people will be upset if by having a book that actually talks about it. But it's also not something that you, like, it, it's really interesting that there's no deep information in here maybe because it's so fluffy and, and so soft and honestly before the COVID, software engineers never needed a resume or experienced engineers and hopefully afterwards you're also not going to need it so <laughs> so maybe you only wrote a book for for this year and uh <laughs> and that, that might be it <laughs> well a, a really interesting one is gail lackman Mac mcdonald uh who wrote the cracking the coding interview i think we all know her for that one of her first books was the Google resume, which is probably oh. the only other book that I, I could recommend that is actually a book about software developer resumes. It's a bit dated and it's out of print as well. So there we go. She started with resume. So who knows Who knows where I'm going to go <laughs> after this? Um, well, I, I think, I mean, for sure, when I, even when I was at Netlify, uh, which is, you know, 70 to 100 people company, um, uh, we, we we definitely st still did a decent amount of resume screening. So I'm not sure, like, you know, how much, uh, you know, resumes don't count. I, I think I think they definitely still count if you have nothing else, uh, if you don't have, like, a referral. Like, for me, for my past two jobs, I got referrals. So the resume was the last step rather than the first step. Um but I think, and I think, I think that's what that's what that's one of the reasons you make a big point in your book about uh, referrals. Like they, they are kind of like a shortcut uh, through through the through the whole system and the funnel, right? Yeah, and and it's interesting because when I wrote the book, I originally I I just gave advice: do this, do that, don't do this, don't don't do that. But about half of the book ended up being about what is going on behind the scenes. Yeah. What happens when you submit your resume? Who's going to look at it? At the big company, the concepts of, let's say, an inbound sourcer, a person who only looks at inbound resumes, and they don't have too much context. They just know the hiring. Like, they're, 
they're filtering for these temp positions and, and they're not an engineer. They, they just, they kind of, so even though robots don't exist, people do act sometimes like robots, like looking for keywords, like in the case of large companies, distributed systems, senior engineer L5 uh, with on, on a backend team, they're gonna look for something distributed systems or microservices. If you don't see it, they might just say no. And there is a huge, so it's, it's a very interesting, uh, setup uh, i've seen again having worked at, at uber when we posted a position especially if it was more entry level you would see hundreds of uh, applications come in per day sometimes and a person will go through that but you only had one opening and a lot of it is that is the, the one thing that a lot of people don't realize unless you're on the other side there's so much noise uh in the sense of a lot of great people apply you know like a lot of listeners here uh you're probably you know pretty good engineers you know that about yourself but there's also region region limitations. So, for example, you open a position and you're not sponsoring visas because even large companies they will sponsor visas for more senior candidates. And still, you will get about you put it out there. You make it really clear. You often get seventy percent of the applications from uh, regions that are not sponsored. Or you might be a U.S. based company, and I found this to um, to try error. There are some countries where the international uh, limitations make it really difficult to hire from very very difficult so uh, there's a uh, u.s sanctioned countries and i'm on a u.s uh, company hires from a u.s sanctioned country outside of the u.s you might be able to hire but it's a very long and lengthy process i actually had to go unfortunately through this because we made an offer for someone and we did the right thing after we found out that it's the uh, they're from a sanctioned country we went through a process which was eight months so they handed it their resignation and and we we could you know, we wanted to hire them but Again, and, and this can be in the US, it can be in other countries as well. So visas are a huge pain for everyone involved, if you ask me, but they're the reality. And that's also yeah. another reason why a lot of companies will shy away. Uh, I've talked with uh, hiring managers who went through visa processes and, and then the candidate dropped out because the process was too long and they, they took a competing offer and you spend all this money. And then that company decided to not do visa sponsorship uh, later. It's it's it, so. Uh, I will say though, I think software engineering is still. I think we, whenever I read online or see hacker news, a lot of people can tell you know, the job process about about visas, about companies sponsoring or not sponsoring or remote work. But tell me another profession where, without a degree, by having a few GitHub repos and teaching yourself, you could get a job almost anywhere. Like if, if I travel to Thailand or to Africa or to Australia, I could get a job there. If I was a nurse or if I was a lawyer, uh, some of the highly paid, or nurses not highly paid, but if I was a doctor or a lawyer, I could not. I, I would have to do a you local to cert cert certification. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and you worked in, in finance, so some of that applies there as well. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's true. I, I mean, I... I... When I converted my my when I changed my career from finance to tech, it only took about a year, uh, and then I was back to earning six figures and all that. It was it was uh, it wasn't that hard. <laughs> so so I think I think we're very blessed in this industry to uh, you know to to enjoy that, and I think um, it, it kind of reflects the, the global demand for software uh, yeah. is that high that that anyone who who can wield software well um, you know has a, has a very good career um, laid out for them. Yeah, um, and, and English is a, a very main language, luckily. Oh, so yeah. Yeah, if, we, we share that, I think, across all of software. Communicate well, um, yep. which is something that I think you're, you're consciously working on. Um, but like, you know, perhaps a lot of developers don't think that writing is a core skill of theirs or like, you know, like if the code kind of speaks for itself. So, uh, you, you know, I, I, you know, I think I think both of us are, are very keen on writing. Um, it's just sometimes it's a bit it's a bit hard to like convince people that this is no like really like this is a part of your job <laughs> yeah it, it is and, and it's communication I, I i feel that the way the soft because software industry is changing a lot and i i'm now i have enough time to reflect on it when i started there was still the the 10x developer was a thing the grumpy senior developer who who know how to sort things out you we celebrated those people and and, and, and then over time, we realized, well, they actually leave a large mess. Uh, they're not really good team players. They don't help with diversity. But I think we are moving to the point where I feel in the past, software was about hard skills. Like you need to know the code and, and patterns and all these things. Now that's still there and that's a baseline. But on top of that, at least um, at the likes of, of Uber and talking to, to my friends at, at Big Tech, a lot of 
companies are starting to say no to people who have those hard skills because everyone has them. It's actually, it's, it's learnable, it's teachable, it's, there's so many resources. So even lead code that people complain about, but you, you can master that pretty easily if you just put in the time. But the soft skills become really important. And I've not seen us hire people who communicate. Like I've, I'm starting to see that it's a big blocker if you don't communicate well, if you're not positive, especially when you're junior, if, if, if you're not full of energy, you're just not going to get a, it is very hard to get an offer from these places, which are fantastic places. Again, this might not apply to smaller companies, but these large companies are, are very conscious and, and just look at Google. They, they, they had a big issue with, you know, just this one software engineer who, uh, who wrote, uh, this email about i think women not being equal it, uh, it was just pretty just more, Im yeah. immature and I, these companies are, are starting to not hire these immature people they're, they're starting to filter them out through the interview stage they're not going to give you feedback on it but they're just not going to make you an offer they, they don't need these people yeah yeah that's true that's true um yeah i can't really help those but um i i think i think we we should all you know bring some level of maturity to our workplace <laughs> it's it's it feels funny that i even have to say that um, <laughs> yeah. just, just to, to, to talk a little bit about, uh, just like, you know, uh, resumes a little bit more, like, um, I think a lot of people also, uh, aren't necessarily looking like, let's say, let's say, you know, you, you, you get through this year and it's back to normal and you're not necessarily looking for a job. Um, is there, is there a reason, you know, to, to continue to update your resume, um, to like kind of, you know, refresh it every year. Uh, or, or is it only when you, you know, when, when you know, shit hits the fan and, and you, there's a recession? <laughs> so, I, I, in, in the book, actually, I, I had a, a section on, on LinkedIn, and I, I wrote this like yin and the yang. Like a resume to mm -hmm. me is, is you use that when you, you're applying. I'm looking for a job. You need to send out resumes for better or worse. When it's a cold application, companies ask for resumes, and you're right, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. I hope it will die out eventually over time, but it's not going to. And even if it does, something else will will will, will replace it. But there's your LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is the place. Uh, for some reason, people love to bash LinkedIn on Twitter. I, I got every single one of my jobs on, on LinkedIn me, while me I was too. not looking. Yeah. But uh, to me, LinkedIn, LinkedIn is is pretty close to your resume, except it's just not as nice as a format. And, and I, I don't think you should use LinkedIn as it's a very lazy way of applying when you just print out your LinkedIn resume and you send it. It did work before COVID and it did work when there's not many uh, applicants. But the, the one thing I recommend to people is just keep your LinkedIn up to date. And you want to keep your LinkedIn up to date, not for what you're doing, but what you want to be doing. So let's say you're a, you're a software developer uh, at uh, a company, but your ultimate goal is you'd love to become a CTO one day. And you know that to get there is you want to be leading teams. Uh, and let, let's say at, at your current company, you're actually given the opportunity to lead a team. Now, if, if you're, if you want to open the door to get inquiries about uh, jobs that are, let's say, team lead or, or engineering manager positions, you want to update your LinkedIn saying, you know, here's my my here's what I'm currently doing, and your title on the top can be whatever you want. It doesn't have to be your official title. So you could just say, I'm a team lead on on this thing, and then you're going to have people reach out to you with team lead lead opportunities. You might not be interested, but uh, you can always politely decline and connect with the recruiter, especially if you're conscious about building your career. The one thing that I've learned uh, through your career is it, it pays to be nice with recruiters, the, especially the recruiters who are not just sending a completely random uh, inbound. And it's worth connecting with them. For a long time, I didn't connect with them because I didn't want to kind of mess up my LinkedIn network. But uh, a lot of people are just really nasty with recruiters. The, the few people who are nice or sometimes connect, they remember that. And when you're be out on the job market, especially the more senior you are, the, the fewer positions there are there they're out there. And the best positions are usually not put on uh, on on job boards. So you're doing yourself like typically I see this people, you know, you get your dream job, you start as a software engineer, you're very happy, and you get LinkedIn requests and, and you get really kind of you know, miffed, sometimes you don't respond, or sometimes you, you have that nasty, oh, you know, don't you see that? Can't you read my LinkedIn? I'm not interested. You're going to regret that in 10 years. And, and the, the best people I know, I, I just talked with the VP of engineering who uh, who has been a VP of engineering at, at a, a company, director of engineering, another one, is, and this person looking for the next gig. They've been searching for five months because they are very specific and and they have been connecting with so many recruiters and they've been playing catch up because they haven't had that network in the past. So it's a privileged position that we're in. 
when I when I mentioned on I, I think on Twitter that I I got my jobs on LinkedIn, a, a person from Nigeria asked me like, how do you get people to write in mails to you? And the fact if you, if you're getting in mails or a request for from, from recruiters, it means you're you're in a you're sought after one way or the other. A lot of people in the world don't get that, so it's also a great one to remind us. So yeah, long story short, definitely keep your your LinkedIn up to date. Uh, resumes, I, I will I will polish it when, whenever the time comes. But probably once a year, I I, I refresh my my LinkedIn as well. I, I usually get a lot of interesting. It's not just recruiter inbounds. You often get a lot of reach outs from people who want to network or want to grab a, a a cup of coffee. If if you're in the same city, I, I probably I'll have about three people per year that I meet like this, which is great. Yeah, yeah, it's it's um. It kind of increases your luck surface area is kind of how I think about it. Like, yeah, pretty why much. Not, why not? You know. Um, yeah, and then the same thing on Twitter. If a lot of people are on Twitter, on Twitter, please just fill out your description. Just talk about what you do, or well, talk about what you want to be found for, what your location is. I see so many people who don't put their location or they put worldwide. You just put it in there because whenever <laughs> I see, for example, whenever I see someone in Amsterdam, I pay a bit a lot more attention to them, and I have met up with people in the past. If I don't know where they are, maybe they're sitting next to me, but I have no clue. Yeah, that's true. Uh, it, 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 your Twitter, as, especially I think if you're a developer, if you take your Twitter as like a professional networking tool, um, it can actually open up a lot of opportunities. And that, that's definitely something that I've found. Uh, but LinkedIn, I have disregarded for like three years. Like I, 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 I put my job title as I have quit LinkedIn. Uh, then people still email me, which is very nice. But uh, yeah, for sure. For sure. I think I think I, think I could be doing better there. Um, what a, let's talk about let's talk a little bit about like small companies like you you, you talked about this divide between big co's and small co's um i have a question here from robin from from uh our, our group the, the coding career group like are tech resumes important even if you don't plan on applying for one of the uh the fang companies like i, I think i think uh in in your book i remember there's a different section for like big co's where the funnel yeah. is massive and then there's there's like mid medium size and small size co's how, how do you kind of think about that difference yeah, so it's I, I think about it in two ways. So first, it's just good to understand on how your how the funnel is different, how your chances are are pretty much different. In general, the smaller the company, the more likely that the hiring manager it, it themselves will, will be looking at your resume. So, a large companies, you have these specialized recruiter roles. You have so many inbound applications that if you just apply inbound without a referral, you'll have this person called the inbound sourcer look at it. Who is it's typically the the least desirable recruiting job in, in the big company. All day, you just go through the inbound resumes with the job listings and the recruiter told you what you should be looking for. Sometimes the hiring manager, but sometimes the hiring manager don't. So it's, it's, it is a bit like a robotic job and you filter out based on you know signals that, that you can do it. It's, you don't have as much autonomy. In, in a bit smaller companies or when there's not as many inbounds, the recruiter themselves will look at the resumes and the recruiter will get the instruction of the hiring manager. So. The, the way this all starts is the hiring manager, let's say in this case myself, we, we need to hire for a developer because uh, Joe quit uh, and Joe was a, was a junior developer. So we're now hiring for a, a junior to, to meet your role. And I know exactly what I want. I actually want Joe. Uh, you know, it can come in, in different genders and, and all that, but I, I kind of want what, what they did roughly. And I'll put it in a job description, but there's some stuff that's not in the job description, things like the level, things, the fact that I'll be flexible on certain things. And I'll tell the recruiter what I want. I want this much experience. It's nice if they did these technologies at a, at a large company, at the, the typical large tech companies, you might not be that worried about what languages you use. At a smaller company, you might actually just need a JavaScript person or a React or whatever. But I tell this to a recruiter and the recruiter has one level of, of in, in direction. The recruiter's job is not to, the recruiter's job is to help me fill this position. They, they get their bonus if, if they hire someone. So they're gonna optimize for that. Now, at small companies, the great thing is, the best thing I think in, at any resume screen is when the hiring manager reads the resume. Because the hiring manager reads a lot more carefully. If I'm reading it, I'm reading a lot more carefully. I don't get too hung up on the format or you sometimes look behind the, the things you see. Uh, you understand the tech lingo. You know, If someone says that they, uh, that they refactored some service, a recruiter might just glaze over that. You might think like, oh, actually, that's a pretty good initiative. If, if there's open source projects linked there, the hiring manager, if you don't have too many resumes, you, you'll probably click on it and you'll actually check it out. Does it have tests? You know, does it have good documentation? Those kind of things. So that's the nice thing about hiring for smaller companies. They'll read it. And the one big difference that I talk, because I talk with multiple hiring managers, large company, big companies, and I ask them about cover letters. 
At large companies, mm. you just don't bother with cover lovers. You don't even read it. At small companies, oh. uh, people typically read it. Well, this depends on the hiring manager, but most hiring managers said that they do read it. So they're actually interested and they just don't have as many inbounds. So I was talking with a recruiter who recruits uh, uh, for most of Hungary, uh, an agency, and, and, and she covers small companies, large companies. And she was telling me, she was like, your book is so wrong. Like small companies do not see 50, because originally in my book I had 25 inbounds for a startup role. I was like, you don't see 25 inbounds, you see close to zero. And I was like, what? She's like, even with COVID? She's like, yes, except if we put up an intern or, or a junior, a, ser a, a company that's that's in, in the US that is not in Silicon Valley just rated Series A. And she said, this, the companies usually mess up one thing very much. They're on TechCrunch and they write about this their product, they write about that they raise a Series A and they're hiring and they think they're done but they didn't do any brand building. They're not on the job sites. They don't pay to be on Stack Overflow or, or LinkedIn, which are actually the paid side, the, the paid job boards. And they just don't get applications. And then they hire the recruiting agencies to, to help them find people. So there are, for small companies, the, the other big part is it's not just about applying to them, but finding the right, uh, finding these small companies. And my biggest advice there is, I didn't know this before I wrote this book, but there are the job uh, the job boards where you have to pay as a company to be there, you know, 200 bucks, a thousand bucks, the stack overflow LinkedIn jobs. And there's a job aggregators that most people disregard. Indeed.com simply hired uh, to some extent monster. You want to go to the job aggregators, search for all these jobs. You'll get a bunch of junk as well, but you will get all these jobs that are not advertised anywhere. And to give a very good example on how this strategy can work, the first mobile engineer at Uber, Jordan, uh, Jordan Bonnet, who I, I worked uh, quite closely, he he was at Uber for almost eight years. Uh, I asked him how he was hired because he he was a he was employee number eight, engineer number three. He was I think hi hired right after Travis Kalanick was made permanent because he, he wasn't there initially, uh, and and so you know like he, he did pretty well uh, afterwards. And he said that he just went to simply he was in France. He wanted to work in Silicon Valley. He went to simply hire because he thought it's a job board or whatever he 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 applied for for 20 companies just randomly three of them got back to him two of them would not sponsor h1 visas and this small company called uber cap he had no clue what it was uh they said they sponsor visas he had a zoom call with the ceo a zoom call with the engineer manager and boom he was hired he had to do it to take home as well and then they did a visa for him they had him fly over and then later he asked like why did you hire me out of all the people mm -hmm. and go through the visa process uh, they, so he had two years of experience back then, but they said they just couldn't find anyone with a few years of mobile experience who believed in them. All the local candidates were like, you're too small. Uh, we don't know you. You're not going to work out. And yeah, they were just not, people were not applying for a, a random job. So on these job boards, I'm not saying the next company will be Uber, but there are all these small companies who are good. They, they, play, they pay decent and no one's applying. So you want to find those ones. And this is especially true if you have a few years of experience. But even if you're if you don't have experience or you're out of a boot camp yet, there are these companies that just don't see. And again, everyone applies. To, everyone almost everyone applies to Stripe. So when I asked, I did resume reviews and I asked people to tell me where they're applying to, and about half the people mentioned they're applying to Stripe. Uh, oh. Most people apply to a remote position. They didn't even realize that there's time zones. So we had people from. Um, Indonesia applying to work remotely with Stripe. And I mean, I, I didn't want to rain on their parade, but yeah, it's going to be super competitive to get in there. It is, it is. I, just, I, just, I just, 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 yeah, just to put it in context, <laughs> uh, I, I know a lot of Uber, uh, some Uber alumni who got into Uber and then they applied to Stripe and most of them got rejected. They were actually telling me it's one of the, the toughest places to get into. So, yeah. Uh, I didn't. I didn't get that far to be rejected, uh, but I also uh, felt that it was it was pretty tough uh, for sure. Um, <laughs> okay, we we have a couple questions from uh, the YouTube audience, and uh, uh, we can we can just uh, you know tackle some of these. Uh, yeah, let's go. You you mentioned you mentioned some some stuff about interns. Uh, how do you how do you think about resumes for interns? Uh, they don't have that much experience. You know, they they just have some college stuff. Um, I don't know if you, you know, you have some advice for those because your, your target audience is a little bit different. Um, but yeah, let's, let's talk about interns. Yeah, so this is the beauty of, of uh, normally I wouldn't have too much advice beyond the fact that it's, it's super competitive. Uh, yeah. 
just just to give it, and this it's really competitive for the large companies. Just to give you a sense of how competitive it is, uh, I'm first going to scare you, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of <laughs> Ooh, advice. But like at, but at, at Uber, we opened an interim position. This was uh, the internship that I was actually heading up as a hiring manager. We opened it up. So we asked for referrals from people because you know if you have if you know some great great interest, put it in there, and we also put it on the website and we left it there for a week, and we had. I think we had like around like 800 inbound applications. After that, the recruiting team kind of filtered down the ones that were just like uh, because of location or, or, or tenure or, or, or some of the things that are not in school just didn't didn't apply. There were 500 legit applications, like people who just look good based on their resume. And we had four openings in total. So in the end, we hired four people of that 500 and, and they just went in stages. <laughs> I think the first filter cut off from the 500. The recruiting team ended up talking with like 120 or 130 people. Then it just went down from there. The different there was a coding challenge, uh, screen, etc., etc., etc. But the the people who were doing the internship process, I actually asked them exactly about this thing on how because they were the ones I, I didn't read through the 500 resumes. They were the ones who read through all the resumes, and I asked them what uh, what advice they have. I also added it to uh, to the book as well. But the 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 main advice is as an intern you really want to show where you stand up you're in a huge crowd of people who all you know like uh, have some sort of educational background may that be university or may that be boot camp but you want to show where your strengths are and if you have any past experience it helps a lot so actually internships uh, interns with past internships look a lot stronger in fact, for the final round, I think at Uber, a lot of people, just because there were so many strong candidates, a lot of people actually did, did have a previous internships or, or some sort of work experience. Uh, tailoring to the job description is super important. So they they also stress that as a as a university recruiter, you just want to see that this person would would do well in, in this environment. And even if you don't have internships, uh, being clear on where you're strong, what is your strongest thing in your studies? No one's going to hire an intern who says, oh, I'm just average. You, you want to say, I'm strong in this, or I, I, I did this. This could be doing a, 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 a extracurricular things uh, at, at your university, having really strong grades, uh, taking on some stretch assignments, uh, and so on. And the last thing with internship that I didn't know, uh, being someone in Europe uh, until a lot, more, more t uh, lot later, timing is really important. So for the big companies, Unfortunately, for those people who are not at university, they only hire from universities for internships, and they have a really strict requirement that when you finish your internship, you need to go back to university. Uh, it's for some weird reasons I, I don't entirely understand, but because of this, you shouldn't apply for internship in your last year, and you often need to apply well ahead of time. You often have to apply six or, or eight months before uh, the school, the summer break comes up, and those kind of things. So <laughs> the best advice is as soon as you start university, you should start to look for internships and figure out how they work and, and, and apply. Uh, getting an internship at, a, at a, any company helps a lot getting the next internship. So again, the earlier you, you're aware, and I was told not, when I was in university, I, I did five years at university, uh, and I had no clue about internships. I in, in, That's one of the things I wish I would have done. And the last thing on internship, if you do manage to get an internship, it's such an amazing thing because you're totally allowed to uh, expect to ask all these questions. You can put your nose anywhere because they know you're just an intern and people are going to really help you as opposed to when you start on the job, people are like, well, you're full time. Why are you asking around? Well, it, it's not like that, but interns get a super easy pass. So just one, one last thing on internship. When I was at JP Morgan, uh, we had an intern who, who came in and they managed to talk traders into letting them shadow how they're doing live trading on millions of dollars. I never saw that while I was as, as a full-time. They, they would have never allowed me, but it was an intern. So sure, why did you do that? Here's a great experience. Go back to school and tell everyone about it. Yeah, I think I think the the playing the I'm a student card is actually a very powerful card that people don't don't know. It's a it's a power, it's a powerful card until they they try it, because uh, a lot of people want to help out. Uh, you know, kids they're they coming out to 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 the industry for the first time. Um, yeah, H Hassan. Um, on YouTube also asks about uh, advice for a recent grad. Uh, I think that's pretty much similar to, to interns, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, nice, and also nice one, one, one more advice I, I, I have is, especially right now with, with COVID, it's it's brutally hard. Like, I don't think it has been this hard since, since I've been a professional software developer, and I don't think it'll be this hard after this ends because right now, everyone is super hesitant to hire entry-level people. 
because they know they're going to suck at onboarding. The company knows. So, I, 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 for example, Uber, we talked a lot about this. Should we hire entry level people? Because usually you pair with them, you, you, you sit with them. They need help because to, to be productive, especially because there's complex systems, there, there's all these things. And over Zoom, it's a lot harder. So every single company will be more hesitant. They'll still do it, but they'll do it in, in shorter numbers. And the other side of things, a lot of people have been let go with experience, and those people are applying for all sorts of jobs. They'll often apply for jobs that that need less experience. So it's it's never been more competitive. Uh, I think it's safe to say in the past 20 years to be a new grad. So you need to have that grid as well. And my second advice goes to this one is I suggest not just to apply 100% of your time, apply, 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 and then eventually get burnt out because you will get it, it's so hard applying uh, my my, my wife is, is is applying currently and it's it's so hard to take any, any rejection even though what when you think it's, it's coming from my other advice is, is as you apply make your skills stronger so build use the rejections as, a, as an excuse so for example put on your take-home exercises on github uh, put it really nicely with tests uh, etc if, if you want to build some websites on top of it it, your practice when you're doing data structures and algorithm, just, just put it online as well. I actually did that as well when I was applying back in the day at Facebook. It'll make your, your portfolio stronger. So use your applications to build your portfolio. And there's a really good advice from Raymond Gunn, which I, I very much agree with. He's a bootcamp student uh, who became a senior developer really quickly as well, so great growth. <laughs> he said one thing, try to contribute meaningfully to open source. I've still not seen a resume where someone says I've I've contributed to this library that's used by that has five thousand stars, which means it's got five thousand users. It's it's a huge thing, and it seems like a big thing to do. But while you're applying, you should be able to find the time. And it's it's not about applying, doing something big, but by doing so, you'll actually have real senior developers at other companies give feedback on your pull requests. So it's. I think just as much of a challenge to to get there than to get into one of these you know great companies. Except it's it's always there. The door is open, and people want to help you. Those open source maintainers. Yeah, I I would say I'll say for sure it's it's very strange. Uh, one of my observations about open source is that it's very strange how you know the bar for open source is whoever shows up. You're you're basically in because no one <laughs> no one else. It's not that competitive in open source. But then when it comes to you know, hiring, you know, it's like, it's like 500 for four positions. Uh, and, but then when you, when you start work and during your work, you use the open source that are done by complete volunteers. Uh, and it's, it, I think it can be a very good move to fi figure out what the tech stack uh, that company is using and then just contribute to that open source tech stack. And then that's relevant experience that you don't need permission from anyone apart from the maintainers, you know, accepting a PR. And I think, I think that's a, that's a, that's a very cool way to, to, to get in as well and it's one of the things i don't i don't see i still don't see it this advice is going around i i think it's hard to get started so it seems like it's a big task for hard. people to do we need to teach people how to do this um, we, we do need to teach it but it currently as of today 2020 it is a sand out thing so my suggestion is if, if you're applying and you're not again it's hard you're not going to be hearing back as much as, as you hope just spend some time carve out either for open source or building your portfolio turning your your applications into something something that shows that you're a better engineer. Yeah. Uh, what about blogging? So uh, I think uh, this is also from Robin from our community. Uh, is having a blog with regular posts something that you look at to hire someone? Uh, same question with GitHub profile. So you, you talked about LinkedIn. You talked about um, you know your resume. Uh, there's other ways to prove, right? We talk about open source contributions, but like a GitHub profile, you know, if all the green uh, or, or a blog post, like, what, how do you consider that? Is it fair to even look at someone's blog posts? So this, this will depend really on, on the size of the company. So at, at large companies like the Uber, Facebook, we just don't care. Like, honestly, we don't. It's, it, it, That's it, what it, I say and it's, it's because of fairness, uh, both because of fairness and because of recruiters. So uh, these big companies, typically recruiters and inbound sourcers, look at the applications and all they care is what the hiring manager says. And as a hiring manager, I'm going to tell people, I want someone with this much experience who has at least done an object-oriented language. And let's say if it's a product team, I'll say, I, I want someone who's worked on a product team or is open to it, or if it's a platform team, it might be a platform. You know, There's a few requirements. I will never say I want open source, whatnot. And also for a lot of people who apply, let's say from, from working at similar large companies, they have zero open source profile because they just work, work at their, their company. Now, 
what a hiring manager looks at, and hiring managers at these large companies typically don't like our resumes. At Uber, I was not the one looking at the resumes. It was my recruiters because we had so many. And then sometimes they forward me one of them and saying, hmm, what do you think about this person? Should we give them an interview or not? And uh, usually I would say, sure, let's give it, or it depends if, if we have the bandwidth. For smaller companies is where the hiring manager will look at the, the GitHub profile, they'll, they'll click through. But on your resume, you want to be strategic. A lot of people just put GitHub and blog. That's not how you want to do it. The, uh, they might click on it and, and they might see the first post and they'll get turned off. You, you probably would highlight like one or two links that you want them to click on. And instead of saying, here's my GitHub profile and here's my blog, say, here's a project I did on GitHub that I'm it was complex because of this and this, and then they can click through and look at that one specific thing. And instead of saying, here's my tech blog, say, here's, I have a tech blog and here's an article I wrote that was well received or, or that's popular. And, and you want to take their attention there. I had people who sent me their medium and their latest post was about some 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 personal posts about how their life sucks. And I was like, okay, <laughs> great. Uh, like that would that would have been just a reject. Yeah, we don't if, care. If, <laughs> So it's, it's a bit tricky because some in some cases, people will not click through uh, to your links. But when they do, you want to make it count. You want to make it professional. Whenever I get someone send me put GitHub links there and I click through and they don't have a GitHub README, they, their, their, their pinned projects don't have README's, I just, OK, well, next. I just don't have yeah, time for this. They don't value documentation and uh, making it easy for you to Understand. Yeah, and 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 they just put up put on things that were not presenting themselves uh, away. So just be, 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 and a lot of people feel that they need to put on GitHub or Stack Overflow on their resume. You don't. We we hire uh, well, large companies again. Large companies don't care that much. At small companies, what I found small company varies. A lot of the hiring managers there don't really know how to hire honestly. And some some people over index on GitHub. Some people heard about the fact that GitHub is not everything. So it, it's just a coin toss. So like with anything with smaller companies, it, it will be um, some small companies are amazing. Some small companies are terrible. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I would say I would say you know my 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 perspective on this is that when you blog or or you know build uh, do activity on GitHub, uh, it's there's a long-term game that you're trying to play as well. The resume gets you the job in the near term, but uh, the blog helps you build a reputation and, and build uh, you know, career capital for, uh, for the long-term game. But it also helps you to think through things so that during interviews, when you're asked something that you've already written something about, you sound a lot smarter because you already wrote about it. Uh, so that's Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that, that's a good one. So I, I don't think, for example, I, I got any benefit of blogging, but I, I did have interviews where people read my blogs and we talked about it. But the big benefit was was teaching yourself. And one more thing that you mentioned about the, the resume getting short term and long term, the, the number one thing that I think a few people realize like, what the goal of the resume is. And this is kind of awkward because we spend like hours writing resume. I think a lot of people just follow a pattern. Now, my, it, my take that the goal of the resume is it's, it's a binary thing. It, you want to get a, a call from the recruiter. That's it. And actually, it usually ends there as well. So as soon as you get a call from the recruiter, your resume doesn't matter that much. Later in the process, people don't look at your resume saying, oh, I, I wonder. No, they look at the notes. What did the recruiter say? How was the technical on site? Uh, how did you do there? So it's a binary thing. And that's why a lot of people have one resume. You shouldn't. You should have you should have a bit of a tailored resume for every single job posting that you optimize for that person. You want them to show, I'm a great fit for this job because of this, this, and this. It, it also means removing some of the irrelevant experience. I actually had someone who is an iOS engineer, has been like for three years, but they did, did like six months of Android early on, and they were applying for iOS positions. And they started with like Android and then iOS, and in the end, they just removed the Android one. It, it just wasn't relevant for that specific job. If they would have applied for, for uh, Android and iOS position, they would have kept it on. And it was a, yeah. the smart thing to do. It's painful because you worked hard on on getting those skills. Like I I I got two degrees during my undergrad, and I had to remove one of the degrees because it was not like it was just generating questions that were not relevant. So I just yeah, dropped it. it's it's tough. <laughs> okay, uh, a couple of last questions, and then I think I think uh, you know we try to we try to wrap it up. Um, so uh, we have one from Fazila, which is an interesting question. Um, so Fazila is trying to switch a company, switch companies after being in a single company for a long time um, to other jobs with, with sort of other, other technology. So they, they kind of feel stuck like in a rut. Mm. Um, this is not, you know, to do with resumes. We're, we're kind of leaving the, the, the resume land. But just yeah. like in general, in general, I think these are interesting career discussions to have. 
uh what do you think uh, how do you have, have you seen people get stuck in a rut and how do they how do they break out yeah it's well i think it's great when you recognize that you're stuck in a rut because I, I see sometimes people stuck in a rut uh who don't recognize it and then they, they later have difficulty going it, it it's not easy though because uh, of course what when you move in hindsight i've been lucky in my career that i i i by the time i would have gotten stuck in a rut things just changed and i had to change technologies so it yeah. and then from there and i started changing technologies I, I joined microsoft i was into c sharp and and, and and windows and i joined microsoft slash skype and uh, our, our team had to change from c sharp to, to javascript that's how i actually started doing like a lot, lot more serious web stuff but the nice thing is one thing you should keep in mind is is when you have experience experience does matter a lot the more experienced the person the less likely they're gonna go out for jobs so if you have two four six eight years of experience anywhere it, it it's a huge positive i think it's important to show at, at that point that you have been doing studying on the side that you're still proactive you're not someone who is waiting for the things for example if, if you go let's say you've been in java for a long time and now you want to go over to ruby or or javascript instead of saying oh i've been doing java but i can learn ruby in, in this case let's just say ruby for whatever reason if, if that's your attitude a lot of people will be turned off saying well okay well your experience we don't want to teach you that but if you say oh I, i've been doing this on the side i built some side projects i'm really excited about this uh i've already picked it up pretty much i'm, I'm ready to do it you'll have a lot better results the other thing is if the more experience you have the bigger network you should have if you don't have it you, you need to work on it. it it becomes really important i have changed jobs like this going from very different technology i was at microsoft doing web stuff and C Sharp and WPF and Windows Phone, and I really wanted to get back into native mobile development. I haven't done any anything uh, on it. I taught myself a little bit of iOS and I did a few uh, projects, and I ended up joining Skyscanner as an iOS engineer because I had a referral there. So when they actually reached out to me for general mobile stuff, I was blogging about mobile and Windows Phone, and I told them, look, I, I although I haven't put out iOS stuff there. I've been learning on the side. I, I have this track record of picking up technologies really quickly, and I'm ready to do it. So I actually joined and I, I built an iOS app there. Uh, but I could have not necessarily done that if I would have gone in from a very cold uh, reach out. So refer referrals matter a lot there. And, and just to give us how much referrals, we, we had the blog post. Uh, there was a Twitter post going around from the CTO of pilot.com, her friend uh, was in jail for i think 12 years taught herself how to code and she wow. helped her get a job because she called in a favor at a company saying this this woman's really good and and she was really good but a lot of people would have not hired com convicts and in the end because of the referral they, they took a chance on it so same thing you need someone to take a chance on you but not just taking a chance on you you need to prove that you're worth taking a chance on and the years of experience does count as a plus yeah yeah um some sort of some level of generalist uh, programming ability transfers across different frameworks. And I think if you just show that uh, interest and capability, I think. I and and one, one thing you can also try is, is depending on what company you are, but you might be able to move within the company just to a different team. Even if you know you're not going to stay, stay there for long, move teams, move to a different technology stack. And large, large tech companies, this is really easy. And, and others, it's, it's not hard. But if you just talk to your manager saying, I think, like, look, you, you know what you want to leave. Talk to your manager and say, like, hey, I'd like to do this other thing that I see in, in the company. Otherwise, I'm thinking of leaving. You can just be honest with them. And there's, as a manager, I'll tell you, if, if some, one of my, the people on my team comes up to me and said, hey, I'd like to do something within the company, uh, X, Y, Z. Otherwise, I, I think I, I, I might be considering leaving. I will do whatever I can to keep them. OK, they're going to leave my team. Fair. But I'm going to do whatever I can to keep them within the company. Yeah. Actually, uh, for what it's worth, I did that uh, with a uh, with a competing job offer, and I got a raise. Uh, so <laughs> that was, yeah, that was well, that's, that's a different one. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. One one last question from the audience, and then we can we can uh, wrap up with uh, you, chat about launching your your book because your your book is going to be launched. Uh, well, this one comes from Anurag Sharma, uh, basically asking about restructuring at Uber Amsterdam. Uh, we don't have to talk about specifics about Uber Amsterdam, but just like. You know, when a team goes through something as traumatic as a restructuring, um, how do you, especially when you're in charge of the team, how do you how do you sort of handle it? Any uh, insights or, or you know advice? Yeah, so I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert here. So unfortunately, I had to go through a restructuring thanks to COVID, as as with yeah. 
I think probably like a third of the software world or a quarter, something like that was, was impacted. And, and some people, the last time this happened was a financial crisis where so many companies were there. It's well, first it's just really hard. It's, it's really nerve wracking. Somehow the word usually gets out, you know, something's going to be going on. You're worried. Is it going to be me or, and then even if you don't know that it's not going to be you, is it going to be my, my team members uh, who I know or, or people who I work with? And then the, the, the news typically strikes. Uh, it's, it's it's a really bad day or a really bad week because you now have to say goodbye to people. Like either you were impacted and well, that's, I wasn't impacted, so I, I won't be able to talk about that, but that's probably something else. Uh, but then, you know, you know who your teams are impacted. You, you, you say goodbye to them and then you need to figure out what next. <laughs> and oh, like th there's things on how you deal with this as a, as a, a team lead and, and how as a person, but you always want to, like good leadership does recognize that that things are like there's been a big change you can't just do things as you've done for 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 start you have fewer people so you need to do fewer things and good leadership will make it clear here's the things we're cutting here's the things we're not going to do usually team team changes will follow so if people are let go and and it will be a restructure some teams will have to change now if your team is not on here that's you know that's actually good you just keep on doing what you're doing maybe you get extra responsibilities or maybe some things go away if you're on a team that is uh is, is needing to be restructured maybe the stuff that you're working on it is it's the part that makes no sense with fewer people then you know it, it can be demoralizing thinking oh you know what's going to happen to me is my work's no longer important I like to think of this as, as change and, and change. You want to say, look at the opportunity. What is the opportunity in it for me? Now, typically, companies with a restructure, they will start to have people work on more important stuff than before. So often they'll say, let's stop working on this project, but let's work on this other one because uh, it will bring in more money, more things. And usually in a change like this, a lot of people will be negative. They'll drag their feet. If you're someone who says, you know what, this change, I get it. It's it, It's been tough. It's behind us. But I, I, I want to do the best that I can. I want to help uh, the team, the company. I know there's changing, so let me see where I can apply my, you know, whatever my in interests are. You can actually make a really, you can come out of changes really well. Uh, and <laughs> looking back, th the best learning in my career were after these changes. So this includes like the, the recent restructuring, for example, that, that, that happened here. But even uh, I had some traumatic changes where uh, we were hired again. That, that's a story when I joined my, uh, Skype uh, slash Microsoft, and we were told that we use C Sharp and uh, XAML, and I had to we had to do HTML and JavaScript. And I was uh, looking back; it was a really great learning. So just don't forget that some of your more stre most stressful moments will be some of your best learnings. And changes is the longer you're in this, you realize change happens all the time. Restructures will will happen. Your teams will change. Projects will stop. Projects will will start. There will be fires. So this is just, just one more of these things. And it's always easier with people. So as long as you're surrounded with people that you actually like working with, just talk to your teammates. It, it like during this time, we, we talk a lot with each other and it helps. Like just, just be honest with with your, your teammates, with even your manager. Like I, I had people tell me that they're they're feeling ridiculously bad and I told them, yeah, me too. And then yeah, we, we, we talked about it. Uh, but, I think yeah. on the plus plus side, you know, this this is a very rare event, like you know, once every I don't know how many years. Um, so. Well, usually the, the changes that, that happen are, are team splitting because they're growing so much and it's you can kind of predict it. That, that's what I've been used to for the past 10 years. Like this is the first time where we actually had uh, going down. It is rare uh, and you get through it. I think it's the, the what doesn't kill you makes you stronger uh, type of thing. Hopefully we're, we're I don't think we're going to see this in a well, knock on wood, but th this is a, a freak event across the world. <laughs> so yeah. Well, I also, you know, the, my motivational speech for, for people, you know, kind of uh, having a tough time this year is that global demand for software has doubled uh, across e-commerce, uh, you know, social, like, uh, media and, and, and all these other sort of uses of software. And, uh, you know, you, you eventually, like, your skills are extremely valuable and, and uh, you're far ahead of, like, 99% nine, of the population in, in your software ability, like, uh, you know, like, you eventually find your spot like you just have to you know figure out where you fit in this new world that, that we live in um yeah cool uh i think I yeah think and I, I also I, I, I think also just, just what you had if, if you're on twitter and if you're listening to these kind of uh you know videos read books you're you're already even a lot more ahead of the general software okay. developer population in, in that you're actually developing yourself you're looking out you're looking out what's there so i i, I will plus one on that yeah
yeah for sure um okay let's uh let's talk a little bit you know i, I think we're we're uh there was a really good chat actually uh, um i was worried that i didn't have enough questions and then p- just people came in kept coming in the, in the chat with with more questions so that i don't have to come up with my own that's great uh <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the book launch uh what's the what's the logistics where do people go uh when is it happening uh yeah, tell so us more. It, 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 it should be happening this week. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be Tuesday or Wednesday because I'm finishing the site. It will be the, the, the secresume.com. I'm, I'm rebuilding the, the launch site because I'm, I'm, I'm doing a couple of logistics. It, it's it's going to be the book. Uh, it's also going to be, I've, I've just finished recording and well, I'm almost almost finishing editing just video nar- narr- narration. I, I got that idea from you and from a couple of, of other people for people who want to have the option to, to get some narration from myself, but they can have that. Uh, and I'm also finishing the logistics on how people who don't have a currently a job can actually verify that this is the case, and then they can, can get a complimentary copy. So launch uh, will be by, by Wednesday, so Tuesday or Wednesday. And yeah, you'll, you'll see a bit of a different side there. If you go on there, uh, you can already get the book if you're interested. Uh, the, the people who are getting the book, I am, I'll, I'll probably give them a little surprise uh, later on. It, it's still a beta, but the final version will come out very quickly. So uh, if you're if you're someone who's looking for a job or looking for for a switch or just thinks you're, you're going to need a, a resume feel free to get it uh, it's i think it's, it's the best resource out there right now that i couldn't find and i, I do hope that it'll help people it has helped in the, people in the past I, i'm getting messages that that it helped people just represent themselves fairly so a lot of people have gotten again it, it will not guarantee you an interview but if if you you have you will be able to craft a resume that represents you just fairly, which which is has not been the case for a lot of people. Yeah, and and there has been some success stories. There's a person who got hired to to Robinhood afterwards, and again, the resume is probably not the biggest part, but they they weren't getting callbacks before. A lot of people have have gotten through some of the big companies. Uh, for people applying for startups, have seen really really good results. So there was a person in India who said they're still getting callbacks even though they they've um, uh, accepted the job. So there might be something in it. I, I think a lot of it is people are using uh, these weird formats from the internet that are just really odd to hiring managers, especially in, in companies that are uh, more US based or English speaking. So yeah, cool. Uh, sounds sounds like a plan. Uh, do you have any questions for me before we uh, wrap up? <laughs> I, 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 one question I had is how, how are you doing with that circle experiment? Because uh, I, I saw uh, that, that you're, you're thinking of uh, either moving together with Discord or without Discord. Okay, so so I think I'm going to keep this Discord for now. Um, but uh, I want to experiment with circle partially because I think that a lot. So roughly uh, 800 people have bought uh, my community section, uh, but only about 400 are like at least even signed on on discord so like they're not that like discord is good for people who are already on discord but there are a lot of people who are not on discord so i wanted to provide an async community that uh does the same thing um but is is something a little bit more permanent um and and so i I looked around and you know circle seems like the the place to be um so i think i think what what i what i'm planning to do is have a live discord for purely for live chat like uh sort of ephemeral like you don't you're not Mm -hmm. expected to read the whole history uh whereas whereas um uh circle is is kind of like where i where i think that uh, you know people will will be able to build uh threads and then uh engage in in a network in in like a safe environment like you can dm each other there's like there's like a code of conduct there's uh moderation tools and all that uh but beyond that i'm also using so i'm also using podia right podia is where where i do my fulfillment like uh, it takes the money uh and then it also gives uh provides the video but i realized that circle also lets you post uh post the the book Um, so and then it also lets you post the the videos so so the the workshops that i've been doing um, people can actually access it right from here. So, in other words, uh, this can be my backend uh, without mm-hmm. even without even having like a, a separate site. So, essentially, I'm just going to sign up for Stripe and then take and then send people straight to here as like the uh, the fulfillment platform for uh, uh, for for the people who buy my book. Um, so, I think I think that's a that's an interesting idea. Like for me, the the bigger broader trend that I'm seeing is that there's a bunch of creators. And everyone, after they create, they always want to do some community stuff. You know, I think, uh, for example, you know, my, my thesis is that um, 
people who are can who read a book want to talk about the book with other people who read the book and usually yeah. you don't know anyone else who's read the book because like your social network you know isn't going to read it all together uh so it'd be nice to you know to, to jump on a discord or a community like this and i think i think that's uh, that's something i'm exploring for sure um so i actually uh, i did my first ever angel investment in uh circle itself uh, nice. so, so, uh, so I'm, I'm trying it out. I, 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 you know, I don't, I don't know that this'll, this'll be the, the place, but I think that, uh, there's a desire for more, uh, community online. Nice. Awesome. All right. All right. Well, this is a good chat. Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, this was, uh, an, this was an experiment for sure, but I think it went really well. Uh, all right. And, uh, I'll see, see everyone around and look up for, uh, Gurgay's book. See ya. And I'm going to end the broadcast. <laughs>